In our last lesson, we covered information science, which was a bit of a digression from the, this chapter on uh, materials. And, but I hope you found it interesting because it deals with a lot of things that are very important in our lives today. For anyone who carries around a flash drive or an iPhone or uses a computer or has one or more gaming devices. Uh, we learned about bits and bytes and binary code. We talked about Moore's Law, which is a way to describe the rapid development of computer technology. We talked about the Turing test as to whether or not or when computers will demonstrate a human intelligence. And we also talked about the technological singularity as an interesting concept. And you may have heard Sheldon talk about the singularity and how uh, he hopes to be around and have an impact upon it. In this lesson, we're going to talk about some emerging topics that deal with materials. It'll be, in a sense, odds and ends, but there are several emerging fields involving materials that I think we should at least mention very briefly. We've talked about nanomaterials, nanotechnology. We've mentioned that a few times. When we say nanomaterials, we mean something that is very, very small on the scale of 1 to 100 nanometers, very, very, very small dimensions. Here are some drawings of some of these nanomaterials. We've shown some of these before. We've, we've shown the structure of fullerenes. Fullerenes are very small structures made of carbon forming a cage, and one of the interests is whether or not materials can be trapped inside these cages for delivery. We've also talked about nanotubes of carbon and the interest in these is in terms of their ability to conduct electricity as well as their strength. I will just mention a few other types of nanomaterials just so that you've heard of them. Quantum dots and gold nanoparticles. A large area of research and applications of materials is in the area of biomaterials which can be defined as any material or surface or construct that interacts with biological systems. And now these may be natural materials, synthetic materials, metals, ceramics, any composite materials which are adapted for medical application. You know, examples would be uh, heart valves and pacemakers and hip or knee replacements, dental appliances, drug delivery systems, artificial skin. The drawing of the poor man with lots of, lots of parts shows you a variety of ways in which biomaterials have been used or can potentially be used to replace body parts. Now in the area of biomaterials, the important topics are such things as the strength of material, its elasticity, porosity, solubility, whether or not it will bond to the biological substrate, that is will it, will it take, will it hold where we want it to graft to, biodegradability, and very important biocompatibility. We don't want our bodies to form antigens against the material and reject the material. So this is a, a growing field, and I'm sure you probably know someone, perhaps someone in your family who's had some type of hip replacement, knee replacement, stent in their artery, some type of biomedical procedure involving a biomaterial. The last topic I want to talk about was, is one that I think is very exciting. It involves 3D printing. 3D printing involves some type of robotic printer which deposits a layer of material under computer control and creates a 3D object. And I'll show you a video in a moment to illustrate what we're talking about. But the materials that are deposited have to be special materials that will adhere to one another, to anneal with one another to form the solid object. And a version of 3D printing, which I think is extremely exciting, is 3D bioprinting in which living cells are actually deposited creating tissue. Or in 3D bioprinting, a scaffold is created on which living cells grow to replicate some human tissue. And of course, this is an extremely exciting field with many potential applications, especially if we can use our own cells to replace body parts. Since a video is worth a thousand words, we're going to pause now and I will show you a video clip that describes 3D printing and 3D bioprinting, and then we'll return. What you are watching is an ear being printed. Layer upon layer, tiny droplets are deposited, 
building up the structure. So this is someone's ear. This would uh, be printed to be someone's ear. Oh my goodness. The project is a type of 3D printing called bioprinting, led by Dr. Anthony Atala at the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine in North Carolina. Same technology you have at your very own home, but instead of printing sheets of paper with ink, you're actually printing tissues with cells. The premise is simple. Send a scanned image of a body part to the printer, and the machine starts building. Ears, noses, fingers. Dr. Atala's goal is to transplant the parts directly into patients. So we're actually testing a lot of these structures uh, right now, experimentally. The way it works is the cells are able to anchor onto the scaffold. They start making new tissue, and as that starts to happen, this scaffold goes away. An ear takes between four to six hours to make, printed with what's called bio-ink, a mixture of biodegradable gel and actual human cells. One of the big advantages of these technologies is that you are using the patient's own cells. And by doing so, really, you avoid the major problem of rejection. Dr. Atala has specialized in regenerative medicine since 1990. But it wasn't until this TED Talk two years ago that the promise of building body parts caught fire. 90% of the patients on the transplant list are actually waiting for a kidney. You can actually see the printer back here. And that's been printing this uh, kidney structure that you see here. Here it is. You can actually see that kidney as it was printed earlier today. While implanting kidneys like this is still at least a decade away, it holds the potential to revolutionize organ transplants. Well, up until just recently, the way that we made these tissues was to actually create them by hand, one by one. When you start thinking about getting these technologies to many patients and creating thousands of these organs at the same time, you need to automate the process. And that's where bioprinting comes in. Meaning you can make thousands of kidneys. You could make thousands of organs. You know, you just pick the organ you want to make, but then you allow the printer to do them over and over again. Is this a finger? This is actually a finger. Right now, Dr. Atala's bioprinting is in the preclinical phase. Simpler organs will be the first to reach patients, starting with skin. If this were, in fact, a wound, it would be dropping real skin cells over the wounded area. The skin printing project is being funded by the U.S. military with the hope of treating injured soldiers in as little as five years. But while Dr. Atala's work is cutting edge, 3D printing isn't new. The technology has been around since the mid-80s, mainly used for prototyping in industrial settings. Professor Hod Lipson from Cornell University says that's changing. It has reached a level of technological maturity that it is uh, used beyond prototyping to actually make functional parts that are used in reality, and the aerospace industry is a good example. Some commercial planes are now outfitted with air ducts that are 3D printed, made smoother, lighter, and cheaper than the traditional method. Hollywood is using 3D printing to make costumes, like parts of a suit in Iron Man 2. And a professor in California plans to 3D print a house. In every case, a digital blueprint is either sketched or scanned and then sent to a 3D printer. The printing itself can be done by extruding a liquid, usually plastic, drop by drop, or by using a laser to fuse resins and metals. What we have here is a, a sample of a uh, titanium nose implant. Hod, who calls himself a 3D printing addict, has just co-authored a book on the subject that will be released next week. And the one thing he's betting will spur demand for the technology may surprise you. I think it will be food. I think food printing is to 3D printing what, uh, what gaming was for computers. Already, students at his lab have printed chocolate, peanut butter, even cakes. Beyond food, there are few disciplines Hod thinks 3D printing won't touch. 
printing an iPod, he says, isn't that far off. If you think about the evolution of humans, we like to distinguish ourselves from other animals by the ability to make tools. And 3D printers are perhaps the ultimate tool. Well, I thought that was pretty fascinating. I don't know about you, but it looks like we have a lot of things to look forward to. But still, my advice would be to hold on to your original body parts. This is the last lesson on our chapter on materials. And let me summarize a bit. We've seen that throughout the history of civilization, man has used materials available for various purposes. In the Stone Age, man used the metals available, gold and copper, and, and then man made alloys such as bronze. And in modern day, we are seeing the advent of techniques such as 3D printing to make tools, and the development of superconducting materials which may one day allow us to ride in trains gliding over the rails by levitation. We've also seen how magnetite or lodestone, which means leading stone, was used for telling direction, and this was particularly important in navigating the high seas. But now how magnetic properties are used to store information in our computers. And regarding information, in prehistoric times, man drew out stories on the walls of caves, and then later developed writing on papyrus and parchment and paper and how in modern times we store information via the separation of charge between two layers of semiconductor material at diode junctions. And in ancient times we saw that building materials that were used included straw mixed with mud to form bricks or wattle and daub. And now we see such materials as nanotubes and metal matrix composites are so lightweight and strong they are used in such things as armored tanks and bicycles. Throughout this chapter, the theme has been that materials can have a variety of properties, and their properties depend on the composition and bonding at the atomic and microscopic level. We'll pause now to have a short quiz, and then we'll continue on to the next chapter.